What is my great pleasure to be able to introduce our lecture to you tonight. Craig Scott is a co-founder of Iwamoto Scott Architecture, a San Francisco firm based practice com uh, committed to pursuing architecture as a form of applied design research with projects ranging in scale from installations to urban design. The work of Iwamoto Scott has been exhibited at San Francisco MoMA, the Vitra Design Museum, MoMA in New York City, the Architecture Center, the Guggenheim Museum, and the Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt National Do Design, National Design, uh, I want to say Triennale, but it's the Triennial, isn't it? Yeah. Just to name a few of the venues. Their work is widely published in books and journals internationally and has received numerous awards and honors, including Best of the Year Award from Interior Design Magazine, Progressive Architecture Award Citation from Architect Magazine, Emerging Voices and Young Architect Awards from the Architectural League of New York City. They've received a California Council AIA Emerging Talent Award and numerous AIA Design Awards from the San Francisco, Boston, and New Jersey chapters of the American Institute of Architects. Recent Iwamoto Scott projects include Obscura, Digital Headquarters, Lightfold, and PS House completed recently in San Francisco. Edgar Street Towers, a speculative high-rise high design for the Greenwich South Vision Plan for Lower Manhattan. Villa 043 for the Ordis 100 development in Inner Mongolia. Hydronet, the grand prize winning entry for the History Channel's City of the Future and Reef, a finalist entry for the MoMA PS1 Young Architects Program, and Jellyfish House, a theoretical house of the near future for the exhibition Open House, Architecture and Technology for Intelligent Living. Craig Scott received his master's degree from Harvard University with distinction, and his bachelor's degree from Syracuse University with distinction. Uh, he is currently Associate Professor in Architecture at the California College of the Arts in San Francisco and has also taught at the University of Michigan, at SciArc, Harvard University, Sydney University, and Yale University. Please join me in welcoming Craig Scott. Nice to see everyone, and it's great to be back here. Um, I was just talking with a classmate from when we went to school here, which we were amazed to you know, realize was 25 years ago. Seems impossible that it would be that long ago, but it is. Um, so thank you, Randall, for that generous introduction. And um, I'm going to uh, start. The practice is with my partner, Lisa Iwamoto, and myself, and the work is done collaboratively between us and with a group of uh, talented young employees and interns that we've worked with over the years. And for the uh, purpose of this lecture, I'm going to focus in on more recent work from the past five years or so, and then uh, for the sake of um, thinking about this, the organization of this work, it's, it's grouped basically from uh, large to small in terms of scale, but subdivided into, as the uh, title alluded to, three avenues, which are uh, which referring to three avenues of investigation or design research um, that our practice pursues, that being um, installations, uh, buildings, which consist of commissions and uh, some competitions, and speculations, which are projects where we've 
been asked specifically to think about um, uh, the future in terms of a context. And so I'm narrowing that down to uh, a few of those to enable it to happen in a timely manner. And so just to talk a bit about our process, um, uh, to give a brief introduction to some of the things we think about. This is uh, the work of uh, from art practice and some other architects as well uh, that is a small snippet of a, a lot of the things we um, are, are looking at around us. S uh, architecture is, of course, a highly non-optimized enterprise where any given project needs to address multiple, often competing concerns. We're interested in how to synthesize these concerns conceptually, formally, and spatially relative to site and environmental contexts so that they achieve a heightened perceptual result. Often this has to do with adapting ordinary materials or familiar architectural types in such a way that they be they become defamiliarized and transformed, what we think of as synthetic hybrids. In the case of one-to-one uh, -one installations, uh, which is the first avenue of, um, of work that I'll be talking about, these images um, serve as good examples from art practice and architecture, both realms that we um, often look to. Here, at, for instance, in the piece by Tara Donovan on the left or the Antony Gormley sculpture next to it, th this um, ac accumulated um, set of um, elements or modules is, is something we think about in terms of not only the intensification of material aggregation, which is made increasingly available to us with computation and digital fabrication, but also that this aggregation can produce as a complete and unexpected overall figure. We're interested in the contemporary problem of combining two scales of modular material systems with building form and think there's still a lot of design research that can be done to tackle this question. One way of exploring this is at the scale of installations. And in terms of uh, everyday materials, another aspect of um, that uh, initial thinking, um, I think, a, a, and the potential defamiliarizing of a, such a material, like an example such as Mass Studies Pixel House achieves that where it's, a, it's an off-the-shelf module of a standard brick, but the way that it's deployed um, produces a pretty transformative result. Um, and lastly, th th this is just a kind of roadside um, condition of t ordinary tires, slices actually of rubber tires being used as uh, weights to hold this fabric over um, uh, bales of hay. But where that uh, constitutes an instance of this kind of repurposing and defamiliarization. So with that, I'm going to jump in um, to the work. And um, the first piece at the smaller end of the scale spectrum is this installation at UVA, where there was an extremely limited budget. But we were asked to um, put up an exhibit about our work. We chose two recent projects at the time, P the PS1 Reef Project and Jellyfish House. And we're interested in this um, idea of a pleated surface, which would be possible to show both projects simultaneously. And uh, so we bas basically the materials for this installation were just plotter paper and uh, a lot of digital work to get these images projected across two surfaces of the pleats. So this is uh, a piece of that file. And then in the gallery, as you move through, you s move from one set of uh, the project images to another. And it, so it works like one of those old postcards where you can flick back and forth between two images. Whereas when you 
approach frontally, you see them simultaneously. So it's only upon the observer moving through that they can um, see those images and projects in a more um, linear and understandable way. Uh, next installation, In Out Curtain, was one where it started at the scale of a module, and uh, we were fascinated by this potential with a module that is kind of spring-loaded with this elastic band to work like one of those coin purses, you know, that could pop open or close. And so when you aggregate these modules together, the whole piece um, shifts one, the movement of one part of it uh, affects the neighboring pieces and the quality of uh, the way light is filtered and baffled is constantly changing. The final piece was made with this um, wood veneer la uh, micro laminate and in which uh, or in a manner where the modules were woven together versus the first prototype where they were individual components strung together. In this case, the drawings at the bottom show the unfolded um, piece where every two modules is kind of um, laser cut out of a strip. And so we've continued some of the, in this um, installation work with that material because we found it really um, offers a, a, a wide range of advantages. Here we are invited along with um, about two dozen other architects and artists from around the world to design what was called a rest box for the Guangzhou Design Biennale in Korea. And they, the only givens they had were a format of a two, a two meter by two meter cube that a person could inhabit. And they gave these images of a Korean garden and poem to be interpreted by each designer. So we uh, developed this um, approach of a set of um, what we thought of as solids for a while that made up this cube that then is hollowed out by this figural void in the center that could accommodate a person in various positions. That Those solids later, similar to the in-out curtain, were treated more as hollow uh, modules produced through laser cut folded uh, paper wood laminate, the same material we used before. And similarly, each one was interwoven with the next one. So the, this, this is actually a um, third scale uh, uh, of the two meter ultimate size that it would have been made. They, say, they selected four or so out of the uh, couple of dozen to build that full scale. And what we... Um, enjoyed about this was the way that pattern, this diagrid, the changing density on the outside, which was an interpretation of the dappled light uh, from the images we were given of the Korean garden and the, uh, that, how that internally gets transformed in this space within um, and gives a sense both of solidity and this kind of luminosity that that material offers. And the, so the most extensive use of that material, this uh, paper wood laminate, so far has been this installation at the SciArc Gallery. We, we knew initially we wanted to, ex again, exploit the uh, possibilities of this, the translucence, the thinness, and stiffness of it. But where we began here was, again, with just simple cardboard modules studying how they perform when they aggregate. And it was at this point on the right where, um, I mean, early on in this project was an idea dr driven by an interest in um, a field known as computational origami, where um, people are exploring folds which are not straight edges, but along curved edges, that, that you can produce a kind of surface tension and a more complex uh, formal, spatial, experiential result, but still with a flat material. And so once you start aggregating these in certain ways, when they're not just repetitive like the ones in the upper left, the, the form of the overall surface starts to be dictated to along a curve um, by 
uh, the accumulation of the smaller curves of the folded seams. So this shows uh, the kind of generation of those modules. We involved um, a number of people in our office in this and come, uh, writing scripts um, and so on to be able to um, produce this curved folded seam module off of a triangulated base. Uh, but ultimately, the modules that we worked with were those at the top, th three sides flat, two sides flat, one, one side flat, and um, three sides curved. And a, combi a combination of those, ultimately, is what came together. Uh, it involved a pretty complex process of uh, figuring out the ratio of in plan to section, the height of the curve based, you know, once you fold it, this flat laser cut um, piece, the, the curve um, became a critical aspect of it and trying to predict that was a big part of it. So this is an early uh, study where what w was of interest to us too was a lot of the pieces at the SciArc Gallery tend to be sculptural freestanding objects and that's something we agreed we didn't want to do, that we wanted to make a piece really uh, site-specific and al almost kind of symbiotic relationship with the gallery walls. So this was an early study of kind of filling up that space with these surfaces. And then informing the, the um, overall formal and structural approach was some of, you know, the work by s such people as Fry Otto and um, Gaudi and this idea of the catenary arch being, you know, having this kind of perfect mirror in terms of the compression, the, the version and compression and the version and tension. And so the uh, Bureau Happel uh, Structural Engineering Office, the uh, branch in LA was a, a great collaborator on this early part of the project where we, they helped us with these virtual hanging chain models, quite similar to Gaudi's actual chain models um, that he used to f for form finding in terms of these catenary vaults. And in this case, we could um, test those to see where the greatest stresses were. And there was a back and forth between us and them in terms of the, f the shape and form of the vaults we wanted and the ones that were more optimal um, from an engineering perspective. So that um, surface that resulted was tessellated and a, a porosity diagram uh, came based on the structural stress pattern. And then this is um, the actual curved um, kind of, as we called them, petals uh, shaped modules got instantiated across that surface. This is a rendering which shows the Clara Story light condition of the gallery. And given our installation was in late summer, or mid to late summer, we knew the light would be quite um, striking with those west facing windows. So really the only construction document for this project is this one plan. This is the printout everyone had for the 2300 individually shaped pieces. And it was as much a, a kind of you know, logistics thing in terms of cataloging those pieces and figuring out how they went, where they went, how they got put together uh, was actually, how they got put together shifted tracks along the way. Initially, we thought we'd build entire sections of a vault at a time and then kind of prop those up and connect them to the next one. And that proved problematic. Then we shifted to um, building the ribs that connect two vaults and filling in to the middle. And ultimately, we combined both methods. And um, it all was held together by plastic zip ties, two per node, where each of the modules uh, come together. And uh, this view from above, you get a s sense of the relationship of the space to this um, system of in terms of how it relies on the walls really and 
begins to fill that space up. We were aware of this catwalk that allows you to see the piece from above and always thought of it as, you know, in, in that light. But also, obviously, the main experience is this uh, one from beneath and how with the changing light of day, these modules shift um, pretty dramatically in terms of the uh, at times, you know, they seem very opaque and then they can be backlit, backlit in a direct manner like there and they really glow. Um, at other times you get this softer indirect glow uh, from either the natural or artificial light and they start to, uh, you know, transform into uh, a quite different materiality. And of course, the shadow patterns on the wall were constantly changing based on whether it was more direct, indirect, natural, or artificial light. And so the latest and mo most permanent um, installation is this lobby design that just got completed last year in downtown San Francisco with that material and similar uh, attitudes about a, ser a series of modulated uh, pieces that form a kind of field. This is at Market Street and Third and Kearney and Geary. It's a kind of crazy intersection where four streets come together um, about a block away from SF MoMA. And there's a <laughs> development that consists of all three of those buildings. Uh, at the tip on the right is a, a late 60s Charles Moore building, a not so well known. Uh, building of his that was in addition to the second empire style building from actually before the great earthquake from 1902 that building survived the quake and then next to that the third building is that's brand new it's a, a recent mid-rise that acts structurally with the charles moore building to bracket the middle building and the lobby for all three of those buildings which are conjoined floor plates is um what we were commissioned to do. But it was done as meeting the, t the percent for art requirement uh, for the whole development. So basically a case of kind of architecture as art, or that, that's how we viewed it. Um, and so the, there, at one point we had this kind of diamond uh, shaped coffer system and wall panel system running all the way back through to the elevator. This is at the end of this bent shape of the lobby is where the elevators go up to a, one of those privately owned public open spaces that a lot of developments have in the city. So this is part of the kind of public path to the top of the building. Uh, but at some point we reduced the complexity and made the wall panels, which are made of a similar uh, reconstituted engineered wood veneer product made those opaque and lit at their edges and the cough ceiling coffers out of that uh, laminate uh, translucent wood material. This projector's really dark, but um, I should have probably looked through more of the slides to brighten it up. But hopefully you get a sense of um, the space isn't that dark, um, but it, it is pretty dramatic that these um, elements at when the light, they, they all have LED light sources inside each of these diamond shaped coffers. When the light's off, the, the, I think you can get that sense from, sorry, this image. The, the two uh, materials seem identical. They're in fact, you know, pretty different because one is over an MDF substrate and the other's a very thin um, translucent version. Uh, so we, we fabricated those coffers in our office as part of the project. Uh, we built them, a contractor built the rest, um, and we collaborated with the architect of record on the, the, the mid-rise building that this sits in. And so what we liked about it is this aspect of as you see it from coming in versus leaving the lobby, it really changes. It, it kind of bundles up into this, um, I don't know, people have called it a pineapple or something, you know, it, it kind of 
pulls together into this singular form uh, in, in this view, and you see the nature of these faceted wood panels around it. So some of the, some of the design research behind the installation work has moved into uh, some of the uh, more um, commissioned work. This is for MAC Cosmetics. We've been um, asked in, for numerous um, concept store designs to work with them, and uh, Greenwich Village and Waikiki, and uh, some um, of those are underway, uh, but b similar approaches to this kind of modulated um, s set of surfaces that wrap the ceiling and walls. Another strain of the installation work is this um, fiber optics driven set of projects. Uh, on the left, a piece called Motion that was installed in the SF MoMA Rotunda. Um, fiber optic room is the one after that, which was proposing a, a kind of inhabitable uh, space made of fiber optics. And then for the Guggenheim Museum's 50th anniversary, we were invited with um, a bunch of other architects and artists to make a hypothetical, hypothetical installation into the um, Frank Lloyd Wright's Guggenheim, which the, the, the ex exhibition was called Contemplating the Void. So we proposed a fiber optic array that pulled daylight from the skylight and from the spiraling perimeter as well and, and feed, would feed images of the collection through a, sec a third set of fiber optics uh, projected on the spiraling gallery walls. So you can use fiber optics to project as well as uh, transmit daylight. Uh, so the installation at, that we proposed for PS1 a couple years ago is called Reef, and as you might know, that uh, Young Architects program in the, the courtyard, the competition is basically to design this thing that's up for 10 weeks over the summer where they, on the weekends, have DJ parties, and during uh, the times besides those nights, are, it's more kind of open to families as, a, as an exhibition. But basically, the given theme is the urban beach. And the only requirements programmatically are a pl place to sit, shade, and some water element, that, as well as meeting this very strict budget. So we thought about this idea of being underwater, like near the beach, but beneath the water and the atmospherics of that, and came up with these two kind of uh, types that would inhabit the courtyard, this anemone cloud, as we called it, overhead, a canopy, and these reef rock mounds. And so our approach was pretty minimal in terms of the, the structure. Uh, we decided there's these heavy concrete walls in the courtyard. Let's use those and span across them um, rather than introducing a whole new structure. And so uh, this is the array of those lines, which became lenticular cable trusses. And then the, after a series of analysis of flow patterns of how we thought people would flow through the space, how those lines then get further, um, uh, how they hold these sets of modules for both the canopy and the mounds. So from uh, the street, it was you know a fairly modest um, intervention where you just see the edge of the canopy poking up over the wall with these clipped on steel brackets. Um, and a view from above shows the uh, more of the complexity of that great uh, modulated pattern. And you can tell that the video is going to be really dark because it's dark to begin with. But um, this was part of the working process. We used uh, CATIA to parametrically control all the quantities of, of modules and the, the m amount of material that uh, those modules would be made from by this purple control surface. So we could move that and it would change all the kind of uh, inventory um, and uh, keep track of the amount of material we were proposing. So ultimately, we built a physical model pretty much 
just like the full scale one would be to test this out with the, the 1300 different fabric modules. In this case, they were laser cut out of a um, pliable plastic, but the ultimate full size ones we tried out as well in a polyester mesh. Um, some images of that model. And then those mounts, um, we wrote a script to, uh, which we called Flattenall, where you could take a given um, complex curve or freeform shape, three dimensional shape like a mound, and generate a series of steps um, from that surface. So these would be built pretty simply out of marine grade plywood. Um, and then the there's this kind of payoff when they're uplit from below uh, through all the gaps between the steps. And that's a, a shot of the uh, mock-up of the module. So to test, we did a lot of rendering and fly-through video and stuff, but all, really in the end, the best test was just getting a fan out and seeing, you know, because part of the effect of this would be trying to have that sense of the um, caustic reflections and being this the kind of quality of the light being underwater. And so this is a um, video that was produced by our team to try to uh, convey the, the quality of the space. Yeah, sorry, it's really dark. <laughs> I don't know if, if the lights went down in here, would that help? Maybe not. Or, I mean, it's okay. If not. Oh, is there a lightness thing right here? Is that worse? <laughs> I was thinking that's dark, not this space. <laughs> I don't want to put everyone to sleep. <laughs> um, so basically, it's still, I think we just, the projector settings needed to be a little lighter. But um, the, if you could see this, you'd see the mounds and the places where we introduced water in a couple of forms. One is in the courtyard off to the right, where, where it literally would kind of rain, and and its mounds in the main courtyard, misters would uh, occur. And uh, there's one room, a kind of compact, rectangular, small space where you could come up close with these. Um, fabric modules and, and, and inhabit them in a more intimate scale. But then the point of this video too was to show this transformation, uh, you know, because it goes from the day exhibit to the nighttime party kind of atmosphere. So our team, you know, put in a great effort. They all green screen themselves um, to, you know, convey that energy or whatever in these DJ parties. And the uh, glowing, you know, to try to convey this sense of glowing light as well. to the second group of uh, or avenue uh, of building scale work and so these obviously aren't buildings they're hedges but uh, speak to this, the synthetic potentials of an interest that runs through our building design practice which is how to equate positive and negative space with many of our building projects we've been interested in how to strategize negative space making uh, to create formal equivalencies between solid and void. Um, and for instance, here, I mean, we discovered when we moved back to California in 2002 uh, that 
prevalence of hedges, you know, out there, just the climate and it's part of the culture. Um, but that you get all these strange programming and, you know, conflations, hedge as side entry or front entry at times or front yard. Um, um, and it, that this idea that a singular thing like a hedge can adapt to these this amazing range of conditions and specifically that negative space becomes kind of a driver of it. So briefly, I'm going to just show three slightly older projects to jump into the more recent work that, that do uh, a similar thing in terms of strategizing negative space. Fog House, two to one house, and our entry to the Stockholm Public Library. Um, Fog House was a project where the client at that image in the upper left is an ideogram of what he asked for, which was one story of a glass skyscraper, because he thought his site where he lived now in Wolfback Ridge, this is in Sausalito across the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco. His site has this amazing view out to the ocean and the bay, two directions, but it was built like a bunker, burned into the hill, similar to that image, which is actually <coughs> near, nearby bunkers from the Marin headlands. So that was our predicament. How do we take his desire of the glass, you know, one story of a glass high rise? Because that's how he pictured, you know, being able to take in the elements and see the whole site with this, you know, way of building there. I mean, that's for defensive purposes, but even this house, which was built there on the, on the other side of the hill was a bermed in kind of house defensive against the harsh weather that you get off the Pacific Ocean. But so we thought about the, the fog, part of that harsh weather is this you know, famous fog of San Francisco. And what if you could pull that through the center of this glass house? And so transforming the interior in the process by pulling the outside through the inside, um, where the house suddenly, this glass house paradigm is kind of shifted to one of uh, poche vis-a-vis -vis pulling the fog through this negative space. And uh, two to one house has a quite constrained site condition. Um, and it's the, the kind of adding up of those constraints, the setbacks, the height limit, uh, this access void, as we called it, a way to, you know, a very skinny um, path up the hill was the only way to get to the house. And then in the back are a series of protected oak uh, coastal live oak trees, which had to remain. So it, it, this um, shows kind of the access void and the tree void, the orange and yellowish volumes being subtracted out and intersecting to produce the basic form of the house, which has at its center this negative space of the threshold and arrival to the house. And so when you're in the back where the, the trees are kind of taken out of this view, but that's where you see this, this red line uh, wood panel tree void intersecting that access void sliding up the hill. And then the last of those three projects, the um, Stockholm Library Competition, where in, in Asplund's master plan were four bar buildings, three of which were built by other architects you know, next to his famous library. And this competition called for a kind of library of the future that was more open and transparent and would attract younger people. So we took those four bar buildings and transformed them into four voids and then formed those more as conical shapes in order to flip them back and forth to hold up this, to, to lift the building off the site and let these paths cross through because part of the site involved a big park um, next to the library and this is a major boulevard and we wanted to make a kind of passage through. And so the form of the building is lifted up through that device of transforming those solids into these like giant feet or columns. That, and so in the process, the way those voids cut through lights up the interior of the library. This is looking back towards the hill where the, the proposal was to make a connection to that upper plateau of this hill that's next to Stockholm's building. But in the end, it's through that device of transforming the solid bar buildings. So a few more recent um, building scale projects. The, 
Villa 043 it was part of that Ordos 100 development, which no one seems to know if it's really happening beyond the designs. Uh, some of the architects got their full set of working drawings back for final review and some didn't and some people say they don't even know where the client is at this point. But I, I, we, I haven't heard the latest, but I, I just wanted to say though, that, and if, for those of you who don't know, it's a client with this land in Ordos, Inner Mongolia, who hired um, Ai Weiwei, the Chinese artist, to oversee this project. And um, Herzog and Demuron selected 100 architects from around the globe. Uh, we were fascinated by the landscape. You know, this isn't in Ordos, but in other parts of China on the right. That is Ordos on the left. But, but it, it, you could find instances of this, but in the site, the site itself has this dramatic kind of formation of the um, topography, the, um, the aspect of architecture kind of growing out of the ground and how over time negative space makes its way into that condition. And so we were told that, you know, these didn't have an unlimited budget. You should try to work with the construction materials and techniques at hand, what was local is concrete frame with brick infill and brick veneer. Um, so we looked at the brick on site, is an image on the left where I find it, you know, we found just a stack of bricks. This is Ai Weiwei's studio compound in Beijing that we visited in the middle. And then a kind of extreme of how plastic brick can become is, can be seen in the work of Andre Bloch, a French sculptor slash designer who worked in an amazing way with bricks. So we thought about an age old technique like corbeling as offering a way to approach in a more constructed, controlled manner that kind of s sensuous, you know, plastic quality that brick could achieve. And then the site, you know, uh, you probably have seen some other people present maybe a, a, a one of the <coughs> villas here. Um, Michael Meredith and Hillary Sample, or Lewis or Maki Lewis, or Work AC, Scott Cohen, and so on. Um, the site, it really is that, you know, the architectural zoo in terms of how people responded in such a wide range. We took the given of a square footprint pretty seriously, but also we were kind of, uh, it, it was ch quite challenging. We ended up, which was, with, with it, we drew straws basically out of a t hat to get these sites, and we ended up with this really prominent one right at the entry of the whole development. Um, and which Scott Cohen jokingly, you know, we would rib each other about. He got what we both agreed was the worst site in the whole hundred, and we got what we thought was maybe the best. But it's like a case of be careful what you wish for. Because the more we looked at it, we realized how challenging it was being part of this very public world of this <coughs> new opera house, museum, clubhouse, and very prominent position. But, uh, and along this public greenway that was proposed as well. But it, it did offer this amazing prospect. And this is a view analysis from that site in terms of you know, which most of the other sites didn't. They were pretty much landlocked and on flat ground. So this was our ideogram of how to respond to that conundrum of the, you know, in the desire for privacy and inward focus that a traditional Chinese courtyard house offers versus the ex, uh, kind of um, expression outward to the surrounding landscape of the Western Villa. And that, that's basically what drove the project formally and spatially. Another aside, being in Beijing and seeing the Forbidden City, um, the, the uh, spatial character of that was really in incredible to experience. But one thing we discovered was even with all these very hierarchical axial orders that you would find these um, shifted um, oblique sub orders across those main axes. So you so that was our kind of analysis of that. Um, so the footprint of the building that was given we stuck to a lot of architects ignored that and did a sphere or a tower or you know, whatever 
they wanted. We felt there was some logic to the planning of all those squares, and that had to do with l maintaining light and views and a kind of certain density for the development. So we, we lifted it up, cored it out with this courtyard void, introduced other voids oriented south and east, which were the you know, preferred orientations that in China and in general, but also that our site happened to offer views to the south and east. And then pinching those voids down to um, respond to the prevailing north winds in winter and widening them towards the views, and then shearing the whole volume off with this tilted plane lifted from the topography. So here you can see how that negative space figure plays out as it um, works through the building and how that is in relation to the vertical circulation, which is basically like a double helix stair, one inside, one interior and one exterior, wrapping that central courtyard. And how that the exterior one of those two stairs plugs into these three exterior living spaces within the volume. That's a plan, roof plan, but it works kind of like a figure ground of the neighboring three villas and ours. And then some views of it from above, um, turning around. A model, we, we didn't have uh, the resources and time to build this nice big model, but there was a show called Ordos Now in Shanghai and Beijing after we submitted our work and they built these beautiful white models uh, for, for about 12 of, of the projects from the US that were in that show. Um, but so the model, we, dealt, we did smaller study models, but it, one thing this model didn't do is it didn't show the texture of the corbeling and that's a kind of key aspect of the design and something we really sorted it out digitally to figure out exactly what the stepped nature of these surfaces would be like and, it, and almost, you know, trying to achieve this sense of kind of pull, uh, attention or pulling of that brick-like fabric. So two of the elevations of the villa are, are completely flat, the west and east, where the north and south are ruled surface, high power kind of twists. And so to align, we came up with three different brick patterns to to construct the villa with. One is stat, what we called staggered stepped bond, which is, or stacked staggered bond, which steps five degrees to adhere to the five degree tilt of the north and south walls. But when you put a rectangular window in its a shifted you know, brick pattern like that, you end up with a problem. So we designed these jams that would have their um, have the ability to kind of correct that. The parallelogram shape of the outer opening to the rectangle of the inner opening would be through twisting the bricks on the jam. And then so some views of how the skin plays out um, relative to the whole volume here, you get a sense of those raked surfaces and pulling them around this dynamic of the um, circulation that spirals around the courtyard. That's the main south-facing living courtyard. And upon entry, um, you begin your ascent off to the left and off to the right, descent down to the upper and lower levels. And so on top of the stair that's interior is that exterior stair that links those outdoor spaces. The uh, living space, which orients to the east towards this distant view and to the um, west into the south courtyard. And finally, um, a view of the entry court, which we thought of as a kind of auto court, um, private entry space, uh, forecourt to the building. So um, a much more modest project, but one that was built last year is this PS house in San Francisco. Also kind of courtyard house, but this, uh, this building existed in front on the lot, an Edwardian two-story flat over a storefront. And our building is sited on the footprint of a former old dilapidated building that was grandfathered in in terms of being at the rear property line. So this shows the 
negative space and the, the situation, there, there's an entry tunnel that cuts through the front building to get you to the new back building. And then the kind of constituent parts uh, it required a three-story steel moment frame to achieve this very glassy east um, curtain wall into the courtyard. So from the street, it's quite nondescript. Our only intervention really is this um, water jet cut steel door. And then in the passageway, uh, yeah, hard to see again how dark it is up there. But um, we lined that with this skewed, um, Ver, you know, there's basically two materials of the building inside, and we use them as a part of this threshold, this EPE liner and the glass channel that you find on the building uh, beyond that um, entry passageway. But that the idea was to kind of stretch out the experience of the threshold, and um, this shows the basic volume of that building, which came from the maxing out what we could build there, which is a very small house, less than like 1,200 feet interior. Um, but avoiding some of the exist windows on the existing side walls of the neighbors, which legally aren't allowed to be there, but which we um, thought we should respect and kind of stay clear of to let them have their light. And so on the back of the front building on the property is this gra gradually tilting set of EPE louvers that gives privacy uh, between these two uh, buildings opposite the courtyard. The living space on the ground floor opens out to the deck. Um, one of the, this, was, this building was for spec, I should say, this house. So there, there was a pretty tight budget um, but one of the moves we got to introduce is this slot behind the curtain wall uh, of space between the living, the, sorry, the second floor bedroom and a kind of home office or guest room mezzanine above that. And from those views, you can see uh, some, that's a, one, one leg of the three-story moment frame that that mezzanine grabs onto uh, for support that you get this kind of floating wood-lined volume within that white um, plaster overall volume of the house. And there's a south-facing deck that opens onto. And then when you leave, you get this reverse of that entry um, perspective. And the last of these or the last of these built projects is Obscura Digital Headquarters in San Francisco, which is a building we also have our new office in. It's a 36,000 square foot concrete warehouse from the uh, 40s um, and with a steel frame inside. When we first saw it, it was basically like those pictures above, which is that the ground floor was totally disconnected from the upper, the next floor. And the third floor was a mezzanine um, with open rails to the second floor. But the way this, and so our, our main intervention was to cut out three bays in the middle of the building, introduce a conference and meeting room and these, this suite of offices and open space, our offices down at that end. Um, but since the way this company works is that in the lower space is where they do a lot of prototyping of immersive media, um, projections, big touch surfaces. Um, they work with an amazing uh, list of clients from uh, Nokia, Google, Yahoo, uh, Sony, uh, to more people in the music business who've done videos for MIA and the White Stripes and so on. So they have a really wide range of uh, this immersive media uh, that they produce and lots of prototypes and kind of hands-on um, pieces on that main lower level, which they call the showroom and workshop at the same time. So that cutout was for the conference rooms to be able to overlook that space. And that stair is new. It, used, it, it had just a kind of railing and a mean little stair around the corner from the elevator. Um, some construction shots. We 
had an extremely limited budget on this, um, but we got to play around with some standard, you know, commercial tenant improvement construction methods like gauge metal studs in this case, which we made into a series of ruled surfaces that clad in polygal uh, polycarbonate glazing. And those, each of those is kind of this funnel shaped entry into the offices. Um, one of the pieces they needed to accommodate, which was part of the reason for cutting the floor out as well as for communication, is this geodesic dome, which they do hemispherical projections inside of. Uh, that's part of one kind of leg of their business is installing these domes in various places. And uh, that conference room's black stained um, bamboo, so it'll be pretty hard to see probably. But the side of it, because we wanted this stair to link these two levels, and there's the existing braced frame, you know, seismic bracing to the building, the side of this conference room kind of shrink wraps that brace frame to let you slip by and go down the stair. And the resulting form comes from hugging that angle of the brace frame. That was also built with light gauge metal studs and just uh, plaster. And then the lining to the conference room is, is perforated uh, with a pattern for acoustic reasons uh, that kind of radiates out with the light uh, array that we installed too. And so that's this, you know, you can't see much there, but overlook into the workshop slash showroom down below. So we're now at work on fabricating this screen kind of digital fabrication project at the end of that space opposite the conference room, which is gonna subdivide our office from the rest of the space. It's, it's kind of a wide open situation now. But we, we took the geometry of the dome that's just in front of this and kind of imprinted it as a form into this pixelated surface. And these are being made out of um, plasma cut uh, sheet metal modules, which are folded up like open-ended boxes. So facing out to the uh, main space will be the, all these opaque surfaces, which the digital obscura can use to project onto, because part of their business is projecting onto complex surfaces and facades, like they just did the Gary Disney concert hall. They projected on the Guggenheim recently. They're now doing the Sydney Opera House. So they write the software, they um, hack the hardware and do the content of the projections. All of that work is done by this company. So they see this building as a place to test out that process. So then on the back side are these open kind of cubbies where we can, you know, maybe store some stuff and um, I, the last work I'll try to move quickly through is these three spec, this is this um, speculative um, avenue of design research where, you know, we, we, we didn't just come up with this, just it was more coincidental that at first but that we were asked to look at the future as a site and context. So we, it's exciting for us because it lets us think about new technologies and materials, things maybe on the bleeding edge, which are just barely coming into architecture and building, but which are out there like UV um, uh, and titanium dioxide being used to filter gray water on the left or algae being grown for hydrogen fuel. Um, or and basically the, the what if is kind of the question, which is the title of the Greenwich South project, which you'll see in a minute. So the first of these three projects is Jellyfish House, commissioned by the Vitra Design Museum in Germany. They asked about a dozen architects from around the world to, to think ahead into the near future, maybe 25 to 40 years, about um, a critique of the smart house, essentially, was the theme. Um, so they asked each architect to look at their specific locale, and this is the San Francisco Bay Area. We had already been thinking about Treasure Island, a big development in the works. And this is an analysis of the currents that in, in, uh, 
relation to the island, but we thought about how that island, it's an artificial island, and those images at the top show its making out of bay fill. You know, they, they made it for this World Exposition in 1939 that coincided with the opening of the bay and Golden Gate Bridges. And it's now, you know, a former Navy base full of toxic stuff being handed back to the city. So in the middle is a diagram, an ideogram of how we might think of those toxic areas on the site ultimately as giving back clean water to the bay was the idea of that strip. And these are just more the idea of perforating the island, which used to be a sandbar and kind of wetlands off of the natural island of Yerba Buena so that, you know, patterns, looking at how patterns could be driven from those existing flows. This is a, a, another kind of ideogram of the water being proposed for the whole project as thinking of it as a kind of organism in terms of the wetlands we are introducing, new canals and these strands of um, so-called jellyfish houses, an aerial view of that. They really asked for a single house, so we went beyond. We wanted to think at a bigger urban scale, but we pretty quickly came back to the single house, which was the focus of the exhibit. But in the process, went through these iterations of how these could aggregate and permutate. Uh, and so this is a study of program, an idea about three strands of space of a live zone, a work zone, and the landscape, which we knew we wanted to really fold into the project. And so out of those permutations, it's the second on the left that we hon honed in on for the house. Um, also early studies in the process, thinking about how twisting those surfaces could direct rainwater. At that time, we thought of the water aspect of this house of, as being like a spine, um, but that changed along the way. Um, these are some of the um, geometries behind the project in terms of how it, um, uh, a system like um, at Voronoi and Delani tessellation can um, be adapted to the complexity of these surfaces. Uh, the skin on the left that shows these kind of pores or points where water would be pulled in for the purpose of harvesting rainwater. Um, other technologies we proposed, um, as I mentioned, the method of filtering gray water. If the skin could be translucent, you could pull daylight through it. You could actually um, filter water, as well as phase change material, which already in Germany, there's some examples of integrating this into architecture, but where this kind of quilted um, liner of this water jacket skin, as we we're calling it, um, would be able to store heat and release heat, um, and they're using that. You know, it's the stuff in those freezer packs. Like, there's a way to kind of capitalize on that as a passive heat and cooling system. And then lastly, that that's a, 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 our, an inner layer of the skin could have this kind of blushing quality, like the creature, you know, that it's named after, that could convey images or just it's in the inner workings of that um, skin. Um, the structural analysis of the first version um, guided the density of the pattern, a more developed second version, where through generative components, we were able to kind of adapt this module to um, the density based on the stresses. And then that module at the bottom, you can see it, whether it's more vertical or horizontal, has a deeper um, kind of dish to it to try to pull in um, rainwater into the hollowness of those structural tubes. Um, an image showing it all kind of coming together, and that's just a rendering of the skeleton and a big 3D print of that, which we just had remade because this project was acquired uh, for the permanent collection at SF MoMA. So we kind of revisited it recently to put it together and for acquisition. Um, it, rendering it, you know, it, it's like we were proposing the skin is in a changing state. Um, so st still renderings don't really tell the story. So it was this fly through that um, we thought was, this is a, a little speeded up version of it, but might convey the 
um, quality of this um, space, you know, which could shift from a more neutral, opaque, you know, kind of more normative situation with the walls being um, opaque to this state of revealing the inner workings of that hollow uh, structural slash infrastructural skeleton. And the, I mean, Jellyfish House, it, it was inspired by this idea, like the jellyfish is a very sophisticated creature given that it has basically no, uh, it can't see, it has no central nervous system, or, but it has a quite sophisticated way of re responding to its environment. Um, and um, that's how we thought of the house, inspired by ideas from uh, ubiquitous computing um, and this uh, idea of a kind of ambient sense of technology, that the, that the smart house of the future doesn't necessarily need to have like refrigerators that bleep, bink, blink and tell you what you should or shouldn't eat or to what buttons to push, but that surrounding you would be this, this kind of performative envelope responding to uh, solar gain, heat gain or revealing and concealing this um, water uh, filtration and collection and it, the shower inside was kind of like a mirror of that harvesting of rainwater of the outside. And so uh, moving up in scale t towards the last couple of projects, Edgar Street, Street Towers, we were asked to look at the tip of Manhattan along with a group of other architects overseen by uh, ARO, Architecture Research Office, and Bayer Blinder Bell. Uh, <laughs> Other people involved were Lewis, Sir Maki Lewis, Work AC, Morphosis. But basically this area of Lower Manhattan was broken up and um, given by the Downtown Alliance to think about as a way to give a new kind of identity, but also to address what they saw as a lack of amenities and a lack of um, cross-town trans, you know, um, tr uh, circulation flow they you know the battery park is full of tourists going to the statue of liberty and the world trade center obviously is a whole other node but in between it can be surprisingly desolate so the site we ended up getting in this um, situation also was a very prominent centrally located one which is the two pink footprints there now an MTA parking garage spanning a former street called Edgar Street, which has been since blocked off. So when we looked at the, the macro picture, we realized the tower is exactly aligned with Fifth Avenue to the north, and um, as well as obviously being at the mouth of the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, but that's what this diagram's about, that kind of bigger scale picture. And then, you know, realizing like the amazing collection of institutions and um, spaces and icons of, you know, on, the, on that spine of Fifth Avenue, which divides like the East Streets from the West Streets in New York. It's the edge of Central Park, among many other things. But we thought that, you know, a tower as tall as this site would allow, as high as 1,300 feet or more, would actually also allow you to perceive that relationship to the gridiron of mid Manhattan and the alignment with Fifth Avenue. So we looked at the kind of twist that might be involved in that. And then with this uh, grasshopper script, we drove a bunch of studies of that twist uh, from the base of the tower to the top. So these are iterations and the negative space produced. But so these are the steps of that script. One is to extrude the two footprints to reintroduce Edgar Street, um, twist the top at a certain degree of rotation, the middle at another, and kind of pinch that together and spreading that and split and trimming it to the zoning envelope, this tapering form. And so we did dozens of iterations and dropped them all into a site model to test, you know, the form of the results of that. And it ultimately it's, you know, this series of diagrams explains it, I think, pretty well. This um, void from Edgar Street to Fifth Avenue at the top. The idea that in that void we could deploy fiber optics, it's been on our minds for a few projects to pull daylight down to the darker street space. That They approached us as having that act as the percent for art 
you know, immediately we thought that was a chance to, to use, um, I mean, it, w at first we actually, you know, sh had the contractor doing the rest of the space price out those diamond shaped coffers and they had no idea how to make those and they had like crazy high prices to make them even though they didn't know how to make them. So we knew because we built a prototype and that it involved this folded hollow rib seam to stiffen it and um, it, it, so we made that. And so that was a case of bringing this kind of intensiveness of labor that we usually put more into the installation projects um, into the into a more semi-permanent, you know, commercial lobby space. And also with the Obscura Digital project, the contractor on that pro you know, he saw what, you know, we tried to describe the premise of a ruled surface that it's just a bunch of straight lines making a curve in the end. And no one gets that if they're not familiar with that concept. Like how do you make a curve with straight, you know, it's looking at plans and sections, they didn't get it. We, showed them rhino models, they started to get it, but it was just building the first one with metal studs and the, you know, the, the tr stud track on the floor is there and at the ceiling it's there, you know, and cutting it to fit with your regular off the shelf metal, light gauge metal framing tools that they said, oh yeah, it's not that hard. But to, to clad that in the polygal, they had to be lapped um, and slightly, it, it, we didn't want them to tr try to cut polygal on a slight angle, like a half a degree tilt, which is what each rectangle is by the time the bottom and tops are twisting differently. So we just devised this lapping method where it takes up the slack. So anyway, it, that, that, those are some instances where we've been able to pull in kind of atypical methods of making uh, from the installation work into the more conventional building projects. Yeah. Yeah. I can carry you. I found the jelly house or jellyfish house to be really interesting, and I think that technologies like that are becoming more prevalent, but. Um, knowing what you know about technology today and how homes or spaces are built, and then incorporating that technology into a space, I feel like there's a large gap between mm -hmm. how things are made today and how you're proposing that to be. Yeah. How do you see bridging that gap and really making that happen? Um, yeah, I mean, I think for me, because we've been asked this similar question, and we you know, now in, in the five years since doing that project, um, or you know, close to five, uh, the uh, technology of 3D printing, which we were maxing out, like to be able to print a, a single piece, that, that, that was the biggest you could make a print 26 inches long without like making it in multiple pieces and gluing it together. And, um, it, it, there are people, there's the guy at USC in LA, there's someone in Great Britain experimenting with one-to-one -one scale uh, robotically controlled um, concrete, casting of concrete, uh, where by this robotic arm is basically putting dollops of, of concrete that has enough, like not your standard slump or you know, viscosity for ca casting with forms, but that it can hold its shape enough and it dries quick enough that they're basically like, like the way a wasp builds a nest, you know? So that's in the works now that the technologies, the, 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 so anyway, so we propose that if you can build a thing, this print a thing this big in 30, 40 years, why couldn't you print a whole skeleton of a house that complex conceivably? But the things like the, um, Titanium dioxide UV light based filtration is used on offshore rigs and so on. And the, as I said, the phase change material, they, like they're just saying OLED wallpapers coming out. We, we were thinking of the walls as having this aspect where it's not only showing what's in the inner workings of the wall through this 
uh, as well as transparent so PV or solar, um, right, that's there. Um, but so I didn't show a few test renderings. We did showing that space kind of turn into a whole other world if, if the whole inner surface were OLED, for instance, or some version of that that could be cheaper in the future, that your walls could transport you to another place, another reality visually. You could be in like the rainforest or whatever. But anyway, I, I think maybe, so I see it not so problematic in terms of the technology is, is advancing so quickly that what's on the bleeding edge now it could be you know, pretty norm normative in 25 to 50 years. But it's what we didn't sort out so much, I think more is programmatically, you know, we had the kitchen kind of in there, the counter turning into the stairs to the living level. And I didn't describe that sequence, but it was from the studio lower level to the kitchen, to the living, to the sleeping. So it, you know, it's pretty intuitive, like working below, sleeping most private above kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, we've been asked, well, how does furniture work in that? How, you know, that, I think that's a perfectly valid question. And, um, you know, there are possibilities we thought about but didn't have time to really explore, which being that maybe, you know, those surfaces out of those could grow some, some built-in furniture or the more neutral version of those spaces when it's kind of turned off from the point of view of the inside would allow people to furnish it more to their taste. Um, anyway, so hope that answers. Any others? A quick question about process actually. Uh -huh. um, and then if anyone else would love to grab this. Um, it was basically, uh, there are about a number of currents that run through the pr uh, various projects. Um, ones that have to do with visual sense, sometimes a sort of haptic sense. A f you talk about effect, there's a sort of structural logic to some projects, a formal logic. And then um, sort of uh, about the first question, there's this, uh, this issue of testing. And I wonder in your work, particularly since it's very helpful to students to kind of understand, um, how does that notion of testing play with all of those various currents? How, how do you actually get to the sort of uh, product of the project? Um. Well, I showed a little of the process, not a lot, but um, I mean, I think it's not much different than any designer kind of getting it to a point you're, where you're pleased with it. Aesthetics come into play, obviously, and just this the kind of eye and hand coming together. But like in the, the jellyfish house, there were some really crude, um, relatively unsophisticated versions of the form of that um, as the initial, when we first got the project, those were, we actually, in that case, it was a call for submission. So we did these concept images and the house, it, I mean, as a house, it didn't, it didn't look anything like the final version and there were several in between. So it was iterative, you know, like any design process, it was, a feedback loop of refining, you know, at liking certain things, the, the kind of crude diagram or, or animation that was in Maya of the rain drops, like that form was not doing what we wanted to in, ter in terms of the space making primarily. But also one of the hardest parts of that project, and it was working with a collaborator who was well versed in this kind of pre-parametric software, it, it's parametric in a way, but, but generative components, but, but you have to input everything with code and, or you did at the time. I mean, I mean, they've advanced and they're trying to have a more accessible user interface. But, but so a lot of the testing in that project was, you know, we had this module more and more figured out and this complex uh, lattice, you know, kind of structure that that module needed to get plugged into if we were gonna get good renderings and especially if we were gonna 3D print that. That was like crucial to have a water type model, model as they say, you know, to be able to 3D print it. So anyway, that a lot of effort. I mean, we worked for a year on that project um, in terms of producing the representation, the diagrams, the renderings, the videos. Um, so it, 
they kind of test it. I see like all of that process as testing in terms of being able to produce the presentation material, but it was, I mean, we lost money on that like we do on a lot of those kind of projects that you, we could never spend that effort on a more standard commissioned work. Um, so we try to gauge it if it's for an installation in a museum or something where we, what we're, you know, we try to do our best obviously on every project, but where we're trying to really push things, we try to make it up economically and the rest of it. But I think that's what probably drives most iterative testing in the design stage uh, is can you, pay, who's paying for it? You know? Anyway. Thank you. Unless there's anyone? Yeah. Yeah.